So for this episode, we're definitely going to have to break it into two parts. This will be part one, and then the next episode will be part two. I'll label it. And just make sure you watch both, or you'll be jumping in halfway through and not have the entire story. Hi everyone, and today's episode is going to be covering the People's Temple and Jonestown, the mass murder slash suicide that had happened. Before I get into this case, however, I'd like to say that when I'm talking about cases like this in general and others, I mean absolutely no disrespect to the survivors, the people involved, victims, and families. I just do my research and then I present you the information and sometimes my feedback on the case and situations. If you're uncomfortable with any of the topics that we're going to be covering today, just take care of yourself, put yourself first, don't continue with this episode, I'll have no hard feelings towards you, and with that being said, today's case is going to be covering topics that include, but aren't limited to, sexual abuse, mental abuse, religious propaganda, cult, suicide, murder, and overall violence. So before I get too deep into what Jonestown was and who Jim Jones was, I just wanted to say that this case was suggested by Michael George. I want to give a thank you for suggesting it. It was definitely very, very in-depth, and I'm hoping that I go in-depth enough to give you accurate coverage and representation. So let's start out with Jim Jones and his early life and who he was. James Warren Jones was born on May 13th of 1931 in the rural com community of Crete, Indiana to a James Thurman Jones and a Leonetta Putnam Jones. Jones' father was disabled after World War I and suffered severe breathing difficulties due to injuries he had sustained in chemical weapons attacks. His father's illness led to financial difficulties. In 1934, the Jones family was evicted from their home for failure to make mortgage payments. Their relatives purchased a shack for them to live in in the nearby town of Lynn. The new home, where Jones was now forced to grow up, lacked plumbing and electricity. In Lynn, the families attempted to earn money and an income through farming, but was again met with failure when Jones' father's health just kept deteriorating further. The family often lacked adequate food and relied on financial support from their extended family. They sometimes resorted to foraging in the nearby forests and fields to supplement their diet as well. According to multiple people who were biographers for Jones later on, his mother had no natural maternal instincts, and as a result, she frequently neglected her son. When Jones started to attend school, his extended family threatened to cut off their financial assistance unless his mother got a job, forcing her to work outside of the home. Meanwhile, Jones's father was hospitalized multiple times due to, again, his rapidly declining health. As a result, Jones' parents were frequently absent from all of his childhood, and I can only imagine that led to having an extremely lonely childhood on top of an already very hard economic standpoint-wise pressing childhood, and he really wasn't known to have friends. He was often left to be cared for by neighbors or relatives that lived close enough to care for him. And that kind of leads into the early religious and political influences he takes. So Myrtle Kennedy, the wife of Nazarene Church's pastor, developed a special attachment to Jones, and she gave Jones a Bible and encouraged him to study it teaching him to follow the holiness in the code of the Nazarene Church. As Jones started to grow older, he attended services at most of the churches in Lynn, often going to multiple churches each week. He was baptized in several of them, and Jones developed a desire to become a preacher as a child. He began practicing his preaching in private. His mother claimed that she was pretty disturbed when she caught him imitating the pastor of a local apolistic Pentecostal church and said she unsuccessfully attempted to prevent him from attending any more of the church services. Although they had sympathy for Jones because of his poor circumstances, his neighbors also reported that he was a very unusual child who was not only obsessed with religion, but also death. One of the people that studied him later on in life 
also suggested that he had developed his unusual interests because he found it difficult to make friends and felt like he needed control over some aspects of his life. Although his strange religious practices stood out the most to all of his neighbors, who reported that he frequently misbehaved in a lot more serious ways that should have drawn probably some interventive stuff, like police or child services nowadays would have gotten involved. He frequently stole candy from merchants in his town. His mother was required to pay for all of that theft. He regularly used offensive profanity, commonly greeting his friends and neighbors by saying, good morning, you SOB, or hello, you dirty bastard. He then developed an intense interest in religion and social doctrines. He became a voracious reader, and he really enjoyed studying Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Karl Marx, and Mao Zedong. Uh, he also studied Gandhi. He spent hours in the community library. He brought books home so he could read them in the evenings. And although he studied different political systems, he did not expose any radical political views in his youth. So he wasn't really showing any huge warning signs of being radical when he was younger, other than all of the ones I had just mentioned, kind of being a red flag once you know what he goes on to do. Commenting on his own childhood, Jones stated, I was ready to kill by the end of the third grade. I mean, I was so aggressive and hostile, I was just ready to kill. Nobody gave me love or any understanding. In those days, a parent was supposed to go with a child to school functions. There was some kind of school performance and everybody's parents were there, but not mine. I'm standing there alone, always. I was always alone. Tim Ritterman, a biographer of Jones, wrote that Jones' attraction to religion was strongly influenced by his desire to have a family or be a part of a family. And then once we get into his high school education, he continued to stand out from his peers. He was almost always carrying a Bible with him. His religious views really alienated him from other young people. You know, he's like frequently confronting people who are smoking or, you know, drinking beer and dancing and going to clubs and having parties. And one of those people quoted that he was obsessed with religion. He was obsessed with death. And a friend of mine told me that he saw Jimmy kill a cat with a knife. While he was attending a baseball game in Richmond, Indiana, Jones was bothered by the treatment of African Americans who also attended the game. The events that the baseball game brought discrimination against those people to Jones' attention had really influenced his strong aversion to racism in general. Jones' parents ended up separating in 1945 and eventually divorced. Jones moved to Richmond, Indiana with his mother, where he graduated from Richmond High School in December of 1948. And Jones and his mother lost the financial support of the relatives that he did have following that divorce. So, to support himself, Jones began working as an orderly at uh, Richmond's Reeled Hospital in 1946. Jones was well regarded by the senior management, but staff members basically all recalled that Jones really exhibited very disturbing behavior, especially towards some patients and coworkers specifically. Jones began dating a nurse that was in training at the hospital at the time named Marceline Baldwin while he was still working at the hospital. Jones then moved to Bloomington, Indiana in November of 1948 where he attended Indiana's University of Bloomington with the intention of becoming a doctor, but he changed his mind shortly into that. And during his time at the university, Jones was impressed by a speech which Eleanor Roosevelt delivered about the plight of African Americans, and he began to expose support from communism and other radical political views for the first time. Like, he's really starting to show his interest in where his mind is with them by this point. So, Jones and Marceline Baldwin continued their relationship while he was attending that college, and the couple eventually married June 12th of 1949. Their first home was in Bloomington, where Marceline worked at a nearby hospital while Jones was attending college. Marceline was a Methodist, and she and Jones immediately fell into arguments over the church and their beliefs. And, I mean, that was bound to happen because Jones obviously has a strong opposition to the Methodist Church's, like, really 
radical segregationist practices, and it was a very early strain on their marriage. Jones insisted that they both attend Bloomington's full gospel Tipperanical, but eventually he ended up compromising and began attending the local Methodist church on most Sunday mornings. And despite attending the church every week or so, Jones privately also pressed his wife to accept atheism. After attending Indiana University for two years, the couple relocated to Indianapolis in 1951. Jones took night classes and he continued to do those at Butler University and wanted to continue his education, finally earning a degree in secondary education at 1961. In 1951, however, the 20-year-old Jones at the time began attending gatherings of the Communist Party USA in Indianapolis. Jones and his family faced harassment from government authorities for their affiliation with the Communist Party during 1952, and in one event, Jones's mother was harassed by FBI agents confronting her in front of co-workers because she had also attended a communist meeting with her son. Jones became really frustrated with prosecution of communism and communists in the United States, and reflecting back on his participation in the Communist Party, Jones said that he asked himself, how can I demonstrate my Marxism? It was to infiltrate the church. According to Jeff Ginn's book, The Road to Jonestown, Jones also had his early fascination with Adolf Hitler, and we all kind of covered that a little bit when we talked about the different people he was also reading about Stalin at the time. But he's quoted to say, when Hitler committed suicide in April of 1945, thwarting enemies who thought to capture and humiliate him, he was impressed. After graduating from Butler University, Jones then decided to enter the ministry. In the 1950s and 60s in Indianapolis, Indiana, in early 1952, Jones announced to his wife and her family that he would become a Methodist minister, believing that the church was ready to put real socialism into practice. Jones was surprised when he met a Methodist district superintendent that helped him get a start in the church, even though he knew Jones was a communist. In the summer of 1952, Jones was hired as a student pastor to the Children's at the Somerset Southside Methodist Church, where he launched a project to create a playground that would be open to children of all races. Jones then continued to visit and speak at the Pentecostal churches while serving as a Methodist student pastor. In early 1954, Jones was then dismissed from his position in the Methodist Church, all sustainably for stealing church funds, although he later claimed that he also left the church because its leaders forbade him from integrating black people into his congregation, and that's something he just could not stand for. Around this time, in 1953, Jones visited the Pentecostal Latter Rain Convention in Columbus, Indiana, where a woman prophesied that Jones was a prophet with great ministry and great things to come. Jones was really surprised by this endorsement, but he gladly accepted it and the call to preach, and rose to the podium to deliver a message to the crowd. Pentecostalism was in the midst of a healing revival and latter rain movements during the 1950s. Now just to circle back really quickly, Jones really wants interracial congregations. He's really like a closeted atheist at this point. He's not completely cut off from familial ties, but it's kind of leading to that. Him and his wife still have a huge strain in the difference of belief systems, and Jones is trying to use his quickly radicalizing beliefs that he wraps under the umbrella term of communism to try and kind of like infiltrate church systems and gain followers to fit his ideals and narratives. Jones is well believed to be like a kind of narcissistic character. He's very egocentric and even though we haven't really gotten into that quite yet, it's quite prominent when you look back on any of the videos and speeches he's given. It's very him-centered without it really having to be straight from his mouth that it is, and I think that's really just important to note while we move forward, because he's always had this mindset of it's his way or the highway in his ideals, and that carries into the later events that happen. 
So, believing that the radically integrated and rapidly growing Lateran movement offered him a way better opportunity to become a preacher, Jones successfully convinced his wife to leave the Methodist Church and join the Pentecostals. In 1953, Jones began attending and preaching at the Laurel Street Tabernacle in Indianapolis and the Pentecostals Assembly of God Church. Jones also led healing revivals often, which is where, you know, people would go to the church, there'd be singing, there'd be people there that would have miraculous healing events. A couple of the movements were people that were blind and they were blind and could see after or had been wheelchair bound and Jones basically tells them like, you will get up and walk for God, he wants you to. And it is debated obviously at the time and then later comes out that none of those people actually had those afflictions but during that time period in the 1950s it was a really big thing to be a part of these healing revivals and to show that you somehow had the power of God in your hands. So he was a guest speaker in 1953 at a convention in Detroit and the Assemblies of God was strongly opposed to the latter rain movement. In 1955, they assigned a new pastor to Laurel Street to Branicle, who enforced their denominational ban on healing revivals. This led Jones to leave and establish Wing of Healing on his own, a new church that would later be renamed to the People's Temple. Jones's new church attracted only 20 members at the time, who had come with him from the Laurel Street to Branicle, and he was not really financially able to support his vision at the time. Jones saw a need for publicity and a quick need for it at that. He began seeking ways to kind of popularize his ministry and he really needed to recruit new members. Jones began closely to associate with the Independent Assemblies of God, an international group of churches which really embraced the latter rain movement. They had a few requirements for people who wanted to become ordained ministers and ordaining ministers themselves. They were also accepting of the divine healing practices that Jones was basically scamming people with already. In June of 1955, Jones held his first joint meeting with William Bram, a healing evangelist and the Pentecostal leader in the Global Healing Revival. In 1956, Jones was ordained as a minister by Joseph Matson Bowes, a leader in the Latter Rain movement and Jones then quickly rose to really high prominence in the group and organization. He hosted a lot of healing conventions and the biggest one that I could find was to take place June 11th through the 15th, 1956 in Indianapolis's Cadell Tabernacle. He needed a well-known figure though because he wanted to draw in a lot of crowd and really, really get you know, his followers up. That was kind of what he was focusing on. He needs to gain popularity to gain power in people's minds. He can't just do that with 20 people. So he arranged to share his pulpit with Bram again. William Bram. He was well known to the attendees and he liked to get to know their names and address why they had come for prayer before pronouncing them heels. Joan was really intrigued by Bram's methods and began performing them kind of in the same feat. So he'd, he'd basically mimic it and make it a little bit of his own. Jones and Bram's meetings were very, very successful and attracted an audience of over 11,000 people at their first, first joint campaign. The convention Bram issued a prophetic endorsement of Jones and his ministry saying that God uses the power of this convention to send forth a new great ministry, kind of referencing Jones and the church that he's establishing. So he got this guy who's there to help support in bringing crowds to really back him to and make him seem like, yeah, this guy's on the right track. He's holy. He's doing everything he needs to. And he was trying to get his followers and others of like mind to believe that Jones was also pretty much prophetic. Many of the attendees believed Jones' performance was indicative that he was possessed by a supernatural gift, and coupled along with Bram's endorsement, it led to a very rapid growth of People's Temple, which is exactly what Jones wanted. He was particularly effective at recruitment along the lines of the African-American and minority 
of people because they were usually disregarded and not allowed. There was a lot of segregation still. According to a newspaper reporter, regular attendance at the People's Temple swelled to a thousand or more thanks to the publicity that Bram provided to Jones and the People's Temple. Following the convention, Jones renamed the church to the People's Temple Christian Church Full Gospel to associate it with the Full Gospel Pentecostalism. The name was later just shortened to the People's Temple. Jones participated in a series of multi-state revival campaigns with Bram in the second half of the 1950s. He claimed to be a follower and promoter of Bram's overall message. During this period, People's Temple hosted a second international Pentecostalism convention in 1957, which was again headlined by Bram. Through the convention and the support of Bram and Matt Bowes, Jones successfully secured connections through the Latter Rain movement. He adopted one of the Latter Rain's key doctrines, which he continued to promote for the rest of his life, the manifested Son of God, and William Bram and the Latter Rain movement promoted the belief that individuals could definitely become manifestations of God and have supernatural gifts and superhuman abilities, like the healing practices that they were doing. They believed that such a manifestation signaled that the second coming of Christ was soon, and that people endowed with these type of gifts would usher in a millennial age of heaven on earth. Jones was absolutely fascinated by that idea. It basically turned into something that he kind of fixated on, and he adapted it strongly into his own utopian ideas and how he promoted these ideas and ideals. He eventually had the idea that he himself was the manifestation of God, and by the late 1960s, Jones came to teach manifestation of Christ and the revolution in his speeches. Brahms was a major influence on Jones, who subsequently adopted the element of Brahms' methods and doctrines and lifestyle. Like Brahms, Jones would later claim to be a return of Elijah, the prophet, and the voice of God, and the manifestation of Christ, and promote the belief that the end of the world had to be imminent. Jones learned some of his most successful recruitment tra tactics from traveling with Brahms, and he inevitably separated from Latter Rain movement following a bitter disagreement with Bram in which Jones had prophesied Bram's death. Their disagreement was possibly related to Bram's radical teachings or his increasing vocal opposition to communism, which we know Jones was really for. That was kind of his main deal. He was even getting his family harassed by the FBI because he was so into communism. Jones gained a reputation as a charismatic churchman who claimed to have psychic powers and healing abilities that weren't limited to but included the ability to foretell the future, miraculously heal those, and kind of just guide those with the word of God. He was a vocal proponent of racial integration as well, a position that ran really afoul with a lot of older church people and elders. In 1955, he established the Wings of Deliverance, a Pentecostal church that eventually became known as the People's Temple. And during that time, he was really noted to work with the homeless and the black community. And by the 1960s, he was serving as a director of the Indianapolis Human Rights Commission because he had helped the mayor at the time win his election with his massive group of followers. That During those times, you might see like 100 or 200 people going out to support these politicians, but because Jones now had over a thousand followers, he basically had everyone out there spreading the word about this person he wanted to win because he knew that he would get a good seat. And he was then given that position when the guy did win because of the overwhelming amount of support people's church were able to give to him. So that's kind of the beginning of where that really comes into play. And once Jones was ordained, he really started to run with the power. He inevitably goes on to get ordained as a minister at the time, and the requirements were varied very gratefully. Um, the disciples members were open to basically any belief system, and in both 1974 and 1977, the disciples' leadership 
received allegations of abuse from the People's Temple. They had, however, conducted investigations at the time, and they found no evidence of wrongdoing. Disciples of Christ actually found People's Temple to be an exemplary Christian ministry, overcome with human differences and dedication to human services, despite any kind of background, ethnicity, or minority. People's Temple also, however, contributed $1.1 million to the denomination between 1966 and 1977. Jones and the People's Temple remained a part of the Disciples up until the inevitable massacre slash mass suicide. And you'd think that perhaps they didn't find anything wrong with People's Temple because they had had such a high donation from them, or at least that's kind of my mindset. They were getting fed by Jones and his followers and the income they could pull. So People's Temple really became a religious community. Jones was really inspired by the idea of a society that could just overcome evils of racism and poverty. Although Jones was very white, he attracted mostly African Americans to the group with his visions of being integrated and having a congregation that didn't care where you came from. So People's Temple affiliated with the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and four years later, once Jones was ordained, he kind of started to really lose grip. Uh, it wasn't an all at once thing. I think he, at least he kept it under wraps pretty easily. But in 1965, he started to warn people of a nuclear holocaust and led his movement from Indiana to California where members became active in both the Protestant circles and state politics. The congregation opened up then in San Francisco and Los Angeles and an agricultural settlement, Jonestown, was then founded in 1974. Jones was really influenced by the Marxist belief of liberation theology, which was really pop popular among the Latin American clergy at the time. He mixed social concerns with his faith healing and an enthusiastic worship style really drawn from the black community and church. Like, he integrated their song and their dance and their movement and really tried to bring that into what he was doing to keep their attention and keep them a captive audience and really like engage people so that he could have a community that understood his effort to realize like his utopian ideal and i really stress his because it's important to remember that he had his ideals and there wasn't really a lot of room for other beliefs in what could be right or wrong Starting to fear a nuclear war, he had re relocated his church since he adopted the name as the prophet and, you know, was kind of acting like he was this hand of God. People followed him in the move. They also had members of the church go down and start building that settlement that was no longer in the United States and try to set it up for a more wide scheme numbers to move down there. But at this time, and in, in moving to California, he really started to show signs of health and mental decline. Many of his followers started to basically suspect him of using drugs and illicit substances more, including drinking. And Jones often claimed that he was on medication for his kidneys and for his overall health. He'd really started to become obsessed with exercising his power over others in this point of the group. And before long, he began to face so many more allegations, most notably that he was absolutely illegally diverting income of the church and the members that had donated it for his own use. And he was starting to get really, really unpopular media coverage, being labeled more as a cult and sexually abusive. He also claimed to be celibate and encouraged others to be celibate as well. He also claimed that everyone but himself was homosexual and that to share in a sexual lifestyle was to divert your, to divert your mind and soul away from the, co from the cause and from God. But all the while, he's sodomizing men and women and sleeping with people who are members of his congregation. One of them even claimed that he reeked like alcohol and basically tried to lure her into the back of one of the buses they had to travel across to California. And I just think that that's kind of really skeevy, but that's not the worst thing that he's done, obviously, either. 
So when he was appointed the director of local human rights for Indianapolis in the town, he completely ignored the advice of the mayor to keep a low profile, and he used the position to secure new outlets for his news on local radio and television programs. The mayor and other commissioners asked him to curtail his public actions, but he basically absolutely refused. Like, he was already up on the podium, basically. He figured they can't take him down. Jones was wildly cheered for at meetings and was an urban league most of the time. And he encouraged his audience to be more militant, capping his speech with, let my people go. During his time as a commission's director, Jones helped to radically integrate churches, restaurants, and telephone companies, the Indianapolis Police Department, a theater, and an amusement park, and Indiana University of Health Methodist Hospital. When swastikas were painted on the homes of two black families, Jones walked through the neighborhood and comforted the black community and counseled white families not to move. He then set up a sting operation in order to catch restaurants which refused to serve black customers and wrote to the American Nazi party leaders that he could that passed their responses to the media. In 1961, Jones suffered from a collapse and was hospitalized. The hospitalization accidentally placed him into a black ward because obviously things are still segregated and he absolutely refused to be moved. He then began to make beds and empty the bedpans of black patients that weren't being treated in a timely manner. Political pressures which resulted in his actions caused hospitals to officially desegregate all of the wards. In Indiana, Jones was criticized for his his lack of wanting to be segregated basically in his viewpoints and the people's temple became a huge target for white supremacists among with several inf incidents of the swastikas being placed on temples a stick of dynamite was left at a temple coal pile and a dead cat was thrown at jones's house after threatening phone call was made nevertheless this kind of fueled publicity for jones and it was generated by a lot of jones activities that attracted a larger and larger congregation and by the end of their time in indianapolis in 1961 it had become far more radical and jim jones was almost entirely responsible jones and his wife adopted several non-white children and it really started to broaden this idea of referring to his household as a rainbow family. He stated that integration is a more personal thing to me now, and it's a question of my son's future. He also portrayed the temple as a rainbow family on its own, and in 1954, Jones has adopted their first child, Agnes, who is part Native American. In 1959, they had adopted three Korean American children named Lou Stef Stefani and Susan, and encouraged Temple members to adopt orphans from the war-ravaged Korea at this point. Stephanie Jones ended up dying at the age of five in a car accident in May of 1959, which I think is incredibly sad. And that might not have helped to his decline of mental state, but it definitely does not exclude him from any culpability of the things later to come. In June of 1959, Jones and his wife had their only biological child, naming him Stephen Gandhi. In 1961, they became the first white couple in Indiana to adopt a black child, naming him Jim Jones Jr., or James W. Jones Jr. They adopted a white son originally named Timothy Glenn Tupper, whose birth mother was a member of the temple. So when we go back to Jones and the visions of nuclear attacks that he was having in Indianapolis, he decided that he needed to warn his congregation and his wife started to confide in her friends that he was becoming really increasingly paranoid and fearful. Other followers like William Brom, who'd moved to South America during the 1960s, said Jones might have been influenced by his prophecy concerning the deconstruction of the United States with a nuclear war on the way. Jones began to look for a more serious escape from the destruction that he personally believed was an imminent feature. In January of 1962, he read on Esquire magazine's article, 
that the purported South America would probably be the safest place to reside and escape from any impending nuclear war and fallout. Jones then decided to travel to South America to scout for a site to relocate People's Temple, which is where they inevitably made stops in Guiana on his way to Brazil. He also held revival meetings there, which was basically an English-speaking British colony at the time, continuing on to Brazil after. Jones's family rented a modern three-bedroom home that was modest, and he studied the local economy and receptiveness of radical minorities to his message. But he found the language barrier to be very hard to deal with. And careful not to portray himself as a communist, he spoke of his apostolic communal lifestyle rather than his Marxism. The family moved to Rio de Janeiro in the mid-1963 area, where they worked with the poor, and they were basically unable to find a location they deemed suitable for People's Temple at first. He became plagued with guilt for abandoning the civil rights struggle in Indiana during that year of his absence, and the regular attendance of People's Temple declined from a thousand to less than a hundred. Jones demanded that the People's Temple send all of its revenue to him in South America to support his efforts and the church, and it went on to debt and to support his mission. In the late 1960s, Archie Jamas sent word that People's Temple was about to collapse and threatened to resign if Jones didn't return soon to the United States. So reluctantly, Jones did return to Indiana. Make sure to tune in for part two to hear the rest of the story.